bell sound always makes me want to walk back, see if someone's at the door. Well, our third son, Micah, was married one year ago, September 23rd, uh, right here in the sanctuary. So he and his wife, Gianna, have just celebrated their first wedding anniversary. And like most couples, they spent months and months uh, planning their wedding ceremony and their reception. If you've been through that process, either yourself or with a son or daughter, uh, you know that can create a lot of stress because there's lots and lots of decisions to be made. Uh, They had to decide on a date. They had to find out if the church was available. They had to find a pastor to do their wedding. In that case, it was pretty easy for them. They had to decide of which of their friends to have in the wedding party. You know, who would be the best man? Who would be the maid of honor? Uh, What would the color scheme be? Question, how many of you guys can remember the color scheme of your own wedding? Just just nod your head right now. Nod your head. (laughs) Then they had to pick out dresses for the bridesmaids, suits for the groomsmen, flowers and musicians and cake and photographer and videographer. And then comes the reception. At the reception, you've got to find a venue. You've got to decide on the menu. You've got to get the music and the DJ. Uh, and most importantly, you have to put together the guest list, right? That's where all the stress happens. Who's going to be invited? How many guests can you afford to invite? What's the budget? What are the criteria for inviting? What are the qualifications to make it on the list? You start with relational qualifications. You know, family, of course. But how far up into the family tree do you go? You know, cousins, second cousins, your mom's second cousins? I mean, are you even related to those people? I don't know. Or how about friends? Which friends? College friends? High school friends? Church friends? Friends of friends? Friends of your parents? And then there's the the reciprocal qualification, the payback qualification. Do you invite friends who invited you to their wedding? You kind of have to do that, right? What about people who did not invite you to your wedding? They get, they get knocked off the list. Who's going to be offended if they're not invited to the wedding? And then, and I'm not saying they did this, but then you always could consider the gift potential qualification. <laughs> now today we look at a different party, and we look at a completely different guest list. We're wrapping up our series, Won't You Love Your Neighbor? And so far we looked at the command to love your neighbor, Remember, Jesus was asked, what are the greatest, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It's a command. It's important to God. We looked at the call to love your neighbor. Last week, we looked at the parable of the Good Samaritan and the cost of loving your neighbor. Now, today, uh, we look at the celebration, the celebration of loving your neighbor. We're going to go to Luke chapter 14 today, and Jesus actually tells another parable here. This one is called the parable of the great banquet. But before we even read that parable, I want to show you the context in which Jesus tells this parable. It's important to know when and why and what was going on when he told this particular story. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 14. I'm going to read the first few verses as we set up the parable. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Now, just to pause here, that whole phrase is only one word in Greek. It's a medical term uh, that, that, that communicates um, a very specific disease that we call dropsy today. It comes out of the Greek word. It means some, someone whose limbs are, have been filled with fluid, either due to renal failure or something like that. But Luke was a doctor, and he used a very specific term here. This guy has a certain medical condition. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Let me pause here. Luke uh, begins the story by telling us it's the Sabbath day. Uh, He's been invited to dinner at the home of a very prominent Pharisee. So this would be like uh, being invited home to somebody's house after church on Sunday. Uh, only something else is going on here because by this time, the Pharisees were not big fans of Jesus. Uh, Far from it. Luke tells us Jesus is being watched carefully. Uh, That means the Pharisees are actually looking for opportunities to accuse Jesus of being a lawbreaker. They're trying to catch him in the act and to try to discredit him by that. So the dinner is sort of staged uh, as an attempt to catch him in violation of the law. 
So it seems that like they've set sort of a trap here. It's the Sabbath day. They're having dinner. And they make sure that this sick man, who very obviously has something wrong, his limbs are swollen, maybe he struggles to walk, but they make sure that guy is at the dinner. Now this is, this is the first giveaway because they would never have done that normally because such a man would have been considered cursed or unclean. So he's at the dinner, so they're trying to see what Jesus will use here, what Jesus will do here. Now remember, uh, the fourth of the Ten Commandments is remember the Sabbath day, it's Exodus chapter 20, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. That, that was the command of God. And they took that command very seriously, but eventually over time, people started wondering, well, what counts as work? So how much can we do on a Sabbath and still be technically keeping the Sabbath commandment? So over time, God's invitation to Sabbath rest became a long and complicated list of Sabbath rules. The Jewish Talmud, for example, has 39 categories of work that are prohibited on the Sabbath, including obvious things like planting or plowing or reaping, but less obvious things like baking, cooking, sewing, tying, untying something, uh, carrying, writing two or more letters, erasing two or more letters, starting a fire, putting out a fire. And many of these Sabbath laws actually are carried on today in conservative Jewish traditions. For example, Sabbath law today prohibits uh, turning on a light, electric light switch on the Sabbath day. So uh, observing Jewish people turn the lights on before Sabbath begin and leaves them on all Sabbath, uh, all the Sabbath day. Now the point here is that Sabbath had been turned into an exhaustive exercise in religious rule keeping instead of worship and fellowship with the God who gives us rest for our souls. And throughout his ministry, Jesus confronted that kind of religious legalism. In fact, twice earlier in Luke's gospel, Jesus healed people on the Sabbath. He healed a man with a withered hand in Luke chapter 6 and in chapter 13. He heals a woman who's bent over double, has a back problem. So this dinner is set up to see if he'll do it again, right in front of them, so they can catch him in violation of the law. So Jesus seemingly walks right into their trap, sees the man, and immediately heals him of his illness and sends him away. Verse 5, then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. Now they had nothing to say there because they knew that Jesus knew what they were trying to do. And they knew that Jesus had trapped them in their own hypocrisy because of course they would get their own ox out of a well because that was valuable to them. Of course they would do something to help their own child. And then Jesus turns the conversation one more time. He notices how the guests at this banquet, at this uh, dinner, had all been jockeying for position to try to sit close to the host. That was the place of honor. And he noticed how the host has only invited his best friends and people who could pay him back, important people. So in verse 12 he says, Then Jesus said to his host, the guy who's throwing the party, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the cripple, the lame, the blind. Remember that language. It's going to be important. And you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And then he tells a parable. So that's the situation. Verse 15. When one of those at the table with him heard this, this would be another Pharisee, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field. I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry. 
and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. There's that same language again. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were, who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. So what's Jesus saying here? Well, first, he's confronting a dangerous assumption. He's confronting a dangerous assumption. Many years ago, when I was youth pastor here at Chapel Street, formerly First Baptist of Geneva, we had an event of some kind. I was working with high school and middle school students at that time. We had an event of some kind right here at this uh, campus, and uh, it was an event where students were invited to invite, were encouraged to invite their friends, and they did. Lots of them invited, lots of friends. In fact, we had more kids show up than I was expecting, and so there was kind of an overflow crowd, which is great. All these kids come to church, some for the very first time, and we had this big event. Uh, well, Sunday morning, um, I came to church, and I was immediately confronted, uh, gently, but confronted by a well-meaning member of the congregation who had parked her car in the parking lot, and when she came, she said, Pastor Brian, in the parking lot, our parking lot's full of cigarette butts. Uh, it's just awful. I said, oh, well, we had this big event last night. There were a bunch of kids here. Maybe some kids stayed afterward, and, you know, I, I don't know what they did, but, you know, we'll try to get that cleaned up. And then she said, you know, that just should never happen at a place like this. Uh, that, should, that just should never happen. The assumption, and I don't know if this is what we, she was thinking or not, but the assumption was the church isn't for those kind of people. Right? Verse 15, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Now this man actually is making multiple assumptions here, at least three. First, uh, this Pharisee assumes that there will be a great banquet feast of God. And the Pharisees would have assumed that this was a banquet pointing to the Jewish hope that the Messiah would share a great feast with all of the righteous one day. Now, as Christians, we know that the whole New Testament ends with something called the Wedding Supper of the Lamb, a description of heaven itself. So there is a great celebration coming. So this is a, this is a good assumption, the first one. He makes a second assumption. That is that those uh, at, the wedding, at the feast will be blessed or happy or filled with joy. Listen to what the book of Revelation tells us about the great banquet of heaven. Chapter 19. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. True. Those who are at the celebration will be blessed. That's also a true assumption. Then he makes a third assumption. This man assumes that he and the other Pharisees have a guaranteed seat at the table. And he assumes that they will be there because of their that they, that they are descendants of Abraham because of their status as Pharisees, as keepers of the law, as the important ones. This, of course, is a dangerous assumption. It's a dangerous assumption. And I think people make assumptions like this all the time. For example, in our culture today, I think many people assume what, they, what I would call the gospel of karma. That is, they assume that... that what God really, if there is a God, that what he really expects of me is to be a pretty good person, to make sure that the good I do in my life outweighs the bad I do in my life. And if the good outweighs the bad, then that's what God expects, right? They assume. I think many people also assume that, um, the way I like to say it, is that God grades on a curve. I used to ask this all the time, do you think God grades, grades on a curve? And people, oh yeah, yeah, he does. Meaning, all I have to do is compare myself to someone who's a little lower on the old morality chart than I am, and as long as I can say, well, at least I'm better than that guy, I have a good chance of getting, a, getting an A. I have a good chance of getting in. That's a dangerous assumption. You see, the gospel tells us that salvation is not accomplished by what we do. We don't earn God's favor. It's not um, he doesn't grade on a curve. His standard is always holiness. So the only way we are made righteous is by his goodness, not our goodness. By what he does, not what we do. That's the gospel. So Jesus tells this parable to confront a dangerous assumption. Now secondly, we see in this uh, story that a great banquet is prepared. A great banquet is prepared. 
Um, some time ago, at that same time frame when I was working with high school kids here, um, I decided to take a group of high school students to Florida over spring break for a whole week. Now, if that sounds like a kind of a bad idea to you, uh, it was a, a really bad idea. <laughs> but at the time, I had a good friend of mine who was a youth pastor in Florida, and together we sort of cooked up this idea. I bring, all my, I bring my group down there. We'll hang out with his group. He'll plan this big outreach event. It'll be a blast. So that's what we, what we did. He was throwing this big outreach event that um, he called the Hawaiian Luau Burger Bash. It was this big event of the year, trying to reach all the, the high school kids in his whole city. Um, and it was really just a giant pool party for high school kids. If that sounds like a bad idea, it, it kind of was a bad idea. But he had this big pool at his house that the church owned, and he had sand carted at the end to make a big sand volleyball court. He had these giant speakers to play music really, really loud. He had brought in all these huge, like, industrial-sized grills, because he was going to grill, like, 300 hamburgers to feed everybody. Um, it was, and the last thing he needed to do was set up the tiki torches, you know what tiki torches are, right? The bamboo things with, with fire on them. Now, he wanted to surround the entire pool and deck area with tiki torches. There, there's loads of bad ideas to this whole thing. Uh, the day of the event comes, so the last thing he needs to do is get the tiki torches, so we jump in his little car, and I head out with him to pick him up. On the way back to his house, this is like 5 o'clock, the party's going to start at 6.30, and we have the tiki torches in, in the car. They're actually poking out of the windows of the car. They were so long. We're driving home, and he sees this kid. Uh, a freshman in high school riding his bicycle on the side of the road. He recognizes the kid. He says, oh, that's Tommy. Uh, let's go see if Tommy's coming to the bash. So we pull our car up next to this kid, and he's classic Florida surfer dude kid. He's got a baseball hat on backwards. He's got his, his um, baggy shorts on. Sneakers are untied. He's riding his bike. He just, he's cool as all get out. He's riding his bike. So he stops, and my friend Joel hollers out the window, Hey, Tommy! You coming to the Burger Bash tonight? And Tommy goes, what's that? So he says, hey, we're having this Hawaiian Luau Burger Bash. There's going to be like 300 people there. There's going to be music and burgers for everybody, volleyball. It's going to be a blast. You think you can make it? And then this kid, in the disinterested way that only a 14-year-old surfer dude could do, he went, maybe. <laughs> maybe. You know, if I don't have a video game or nothing else happens, eh, maybe. So after all the preparation, my, my friend is giving his life to student ministry. After all that preparation, all the effort, the tiki torches, the whole deal, the kid with his hat on backwards says, hmm, maybe. Verse 16, Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant out to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. Now, a little point of interest here in ancient Jewish culture, a big event had two invitations. The first one was kind of a save the date. Uh, weddings happening, banquets happening, whole town's invited, you're invited. And then because it was hard to prepare all the food, they didn't have refrigeration, couldn't predict exactly when everything was going to be ready. When the food was, when finally everything was ready, they would send servants out with the final invitation. Come now, the party is starting now. So that's what's happening here. Verse 18, but they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field. I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. But the other said, I just got married, so I can't come. Now, if these excuses sound a little lame to you, it's because they are. In fact, they're so lame in that culture that I think even the Pharisees at the table would have started chuckling to themselves, or maybe even out loud. They would have been thinking, what's he talking about? No one does that. I think Jesus was intentionally being, being funny here, being humorous, because he's sticking a needle into the Pharisees. No one would buy a field without checking it out first. That would be like saying, I just put a down payment on the house, now I've got to go look at it. You don't do it that way. No one would... Uh, buy five yoke of oxen, which are ten oxen. That's a huge investment in that day uh, without first ch checking them out. That'd be like saying, I just bought a new Mercedes, now I've got to go take it for a test drive. Nobody does that. And what does getting married have to do with going to a banquet? Well, you know, uh, I have all these gifts to unpack. A couple things here. First, when Jesus tells parables, he's making a point, and he makes the point often by, by exaggeration or hyperbole. 
In this case, it comes in the excuses that are made by the invited guests. Notice the first two excuses have to do with material possessions or wealth. Purchase of land, purchase of five yoke of oxen. The third excuse, just got married, is, is different. It's just the general busyness of life. Now, none of these activities is sinful or immoral by itself, but they're all very offensive to the host of the banquet because in that culture, to refuse an invitation at the last minute would be tantamount of severing a relationship. I no longer want to have a relationship with you. What these guests are saying through these veiled excuses is simply, I don't want to come. I don't want to come to your party. It's not important to me. And when it comes to faith issues sometimes, when it comes to God and the gospel, similar excuses are still made today. For example, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm too busy right now to really think about all that. Life's going pretty well. I don't really have a need for it. Maybe someday, when things slow down, I'll think about, I'll think about God. Or I'm having too much fun right now. If I get all religious, uh, God won't want me to have any fun anymore. Or maybe when I get older, when I get older, you know, and that stuff becomes important, then I'll think about it. Jesus is saying the banquet is already prepared. The invitations have already gone out. But the excuses are rolling in. And then the third thing we see in the story is the invitation is widened, widened. Back to my son's wedding for a moment. Let's say all the invitations have been sent out. Uh, let's say all 150 guests or so had RSVP'd, were coming to your celebration. Save a spot for us. But the day before the wedding, the day before, the calls start coming in, the emails start coming in from the invited guests saying, something or other has come up and they can no longer come to the celebration. And let's say some of the reasons are are kind of lame. Like, you know, I have to mow my lawn. I'm sorry, I forgot. I got to mow my lawn. Can't come to your reception. Or my favorite football team is playing on that day. I just don't want to miss, miss the game. Or I decided to bake some cookies. What would they have done if that happened? Well, first of all, they would have been hurt, right? They went through all this expense, all of the planning, and invited the people special to them, and they're being rejected. That's the first thing. But then they would try to see how much of it they could salvage. Maybe they could cancel some of the food. Maybe they could cancel the dessert. Maybe they could cancel the music and the DJ. Maybe they, could, maybe they could find out how to freeze a lot of the food and keep it for later. But what they probably would not have done, I don't know, but probably what they would not have done was go to local homeless shelters, go to the oncology wings of hospitals, go to mental health facilities, go to the local prison, and just start passing out invitations. Come, come, we have this party today, come. But that's exactly what happens in Jesus' story, verse 21. The servant came back and reported to his master, the owner of the house became angry. Of course he's angry. He's been insulted by his invited guests. And notice, the story should end right here. It should end right here. No guests, no party. End of story. But the story doesn't end. And order this servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town, bringing in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and lame. Here's the surprise of the story. When Jesus tells a parable, there's always a, a surprise. There's a zinger. Here's the zinger. Because that would have sounded preposterous in that day, even offensive. Because the people who fit into these categories would have been seen as cursed by God. Would have been seen as unclean, unwelcome. No one would do that. But this isn't the first time Jesus has used this sort of image. Back in Luke 4, when he began his public ministry, he stood up in a local synagogue and, un and read from the great scroll of Isaiah. He said this, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Listen, he sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then in Luke 7, John the Baptist actually sends a couple of his followers to ask Jesus, are you the one? Or should we wait for another? Verse 22, so he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Jesus is demonstrating then both his compassion and authority because he literally heals those people, restores them to health to demonstrate who he is. 
But he, this story is not just about literal healing. It's about those who are spiritually blind, those who are spiritually lame, those who are spiritually poor. Verse 22, Sir, the servant said, What you have ordered has been done, but there is still room. These are some of the most hope-filled words in all the Bible. There is still room. Verse 23, Then the master told his servant, Go out to the roads and country lanes. This is, these are the roads even further away. This is where the truly destitute lived, where even the foreigners lived, the Gentiles and the Samaritans. The master is widening the, the invitation list even further. Go out and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. And I want you to notice the word compel there. It means to invite with urgency, to beg them to come to the party. Drag them in if you have to. Why? Because these people would not have believed the invitation. They would not believe that the master invited them. These people would have thought of themselves as, as forever uninvited, forever unworthy, forever disqualified. And they would have had legitimate excuses. The poor would have said, I don't have the right clothes to wear to a banquet like that. The blind would say, I can't see my way to get there. The lame would say, I, I have no way to walk there. Someone has to carry me. They would need to be compelled to come to the party. Why? Because there's still room. Because the master wants his house full. And then this, verse 24, I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Now, if that sounds like it has a sting to it, it does. Jesus here is speaking directly to the Pharisees. They're all around the table. He's telling them that I am your invitation. I am the invitation. But he's also saying they are the ones making excuses. And in all of this, we see that God, in his grace, listen, God, in his grace, will allow us to decline his invitation. So why does Jesus tell this parable? Why does he tell it to these Pharisees at that moment, at that Sabbath dinner? He wanted to confront their assumptions. He wanted to confront their assumptions about God, about his kingdom, about who is invited, and about themselves. So what does he want us to hear today? I think he wants us to know that God is throwing a great banquet. And that banquet is called salvation. It's called eternal life. It's called the wedding supper of the Lamb in the great book of Revelation. And he wants us to know that you are invited. We are invited. But a response is required. A response is required. Don't assume, don't assume that because you come to church, or because you're a you know, pretty good person, person, haven't killed anybody, you know. Don't assume that because of those things, because of your goodness, that you have a seat at the table. Jesus is our invitation. The response is surrendering to his grace by faith. That's what he wants us to know. Secondly, he also wants you to know that your neighbor is invited too. Your neighbor is invited. Not just the neighbor who is like you, not the one that just lives next to you in the neighborhood, not the one that lives in our country, in our, in our, in our uh, region, but the one who is far off, the one you would never think of inviting, the one you never think would even come or respond. They're invited too. Jesus is saying that he wants us to be like the servants who compel those far off, the blind, the lame, the poor, the outcasts, to come, come. Come to the party. You who feel unwelcome, you who feel uninvited, you who feel disqualified, come. Jesus is saying the banquet is ready. The celebration has already begun. And there's still room. Will you bow with me as I close? Lord God, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for this beautiful story of your gracious invitation your invitation to join the celebration of new life and new hope. And as we remember you now through the bread and cup of communion, 
Remind us again of the joy of your salvation. And remind us that you call us to be those who carry your invitation to our neighbors and to the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.